Thank you for inviting me I got to speak here again in Westside. It's always a pleasure uh, to join with your congregation and to share a reflection with you. Today, my reflection has a cosmic theme. Carl Sagan said that the cosmos is the greatest of mysteries, and I think there's truth to that. I think the cosmos is full of mysteries. Uh, and there are many, many great mysteries within it and that are reflected by our very nature. Of course, the, the greatest mystery among them, perhaps, is where did this all come from? What is the cosmos? How did it come to pass? Where did we come from? What is our role in all of this? And I think it's, it's interesting because we've been able to learn a lot more about the cosmos. The, the mystery that was there has become more illuminated. And we've, we've learned so much more, but there is still something about the very beginning that remains a mystery and perhaps will always remain a mystery. And we can go back very, very far. We can go back to the first nonillionth of a second and see what was in that first expansion. And what we're looking at here is actually the cosmic microwave background. This is radiation that surrounds us all. We can't see it, we can't, we can't really pick it up with our naked eye, but we can, using very complicated instruments, detect this. And this flows around us, in and around us, in and around the cosmos, throughout interstellar space, this microwave background exists. It is, in, back when we used to have televisions that picked up things from antenna, it was the static that you would see when you weren't tuned to any channel that was broadcasting, was the background of the cosmos. And what we see in this, again, just in the very first instant, of the cosmos' creation is a differentiation between matter and energy, dark matter and dark energy, that's creating a structure, that's creating an order to the cosmos, coming into being almost instantaneously. What looks to us as just kind of a pretty picture, an interesting pattern, was the very seed of what we know of today in the cosmos. And what we know of today is quite extensive, right? We have a picture of the cosmos that is much more detailed, much more, uh, more deeper than we ever could have imagined before. This now is our view of the cosmos. This is actually the Hubble extreme deep field photograph, or the ultra deep field photograph, as some people call it. Every bit of light that you see here some of them are a little bit bigger than others, but every single thing you see here is a galaxy, a separate galaxy, with its own complement of hundreds of billions of stars. And this field itself is just one tiny fraction of space that we can even see. This is just one tiny pinhole view of the cosmos. So we are here, of course, in one of our own, in, in the original galaxy that we knew of. In fact, the Milky Way itself, the name Via Galactica, that's where the name galaxy comes from. Galaxy only referred to, originally, to our own galaxy. And now we know that there are many more galaxies than just our own. This actually isn't the Milky Way per se. Of course, it would be impossible being inside the Milky Way for us to take a picture of it. So this is actually M81, which is a spiral galaxy very, very similar to the Milky Way's. But this gives a picture of what we look like suspended in intergalactic space. From the outside, it looks different. This is sort of the Milky Way as it stretches across the landscape, it stretches across the, the sky. To us, who are in it and looking past it, looking through it, it appears to be just a stretch of bright light that paints across the sky. In fact, that's why it got the name Milky Way. It looks like 
Somebody had splashed milk across the sky. It was so bright and, and white. And we've been looking up at the sky for so long, trying to decipher what this is. What are we looking at? The ancients, of course, imagined stories, imagined pictures in the sky. They created constellations out of every bright, visible star that they could see. Each, each constellation representing a different picture, a different story. And here you see a map of all the constellations in the sky. And the yellow band that goes through is uh, essentially the zodiac pattern. It's the, the, the pathway that the planets follow. And the constellations that are on that track are the ones that we know of. Leo, Aries, Pisces, Sagittarius, Aquarius. But there's lots and lots and lots of other constellations in the sky. Now, to be able to take that photograph, that extreme deep field photograph, to be able to look past these stars and out into another galaxy, it was necessary to find out where in space the Milky Way wasn't. Right? So the Milky Way tracks through this like a big band of white light. And if you point your telescope at something like that, of course, you can't see past it. So in order to take the extreme deep field, they had to identify a region of, of the sky that was pretty dark. So they looked in the southern sky, just below this point right here, between Cetus and Fornax. And that was that little sliver, that little pinhole of space is where they got the Hubble Deep Field. Now, Cetus, the constellation, we don't really know that much about. It's not part of our typical zodiac progression. It's just a little bit to the south of it. But the Cetus story actually goes back a long way. Cetus, of course, um, Cetus, we get the, the term cetacean, which we're referring to whales and dolphins, right? And so we, when we think of the Cetus, we think of whales. But actually, Cetus, uh, in the original sense, was a sea monster, it wasn't like a big, docile, you know, humpback whale or something, you know, friendly like a dolphin. It was something scary. It was something you'd be terrified of, a, a real monster. And in fact, the Cetus that is in the sky, in the constellation, comes to us from the Greek myth cycle associated with Perseus. And Perseus was one of the original Greek heroes, one of the demigod heroes. He preceded uh, Heracles and Theseus and many others. And the story of Perseus is that he was the son of a god, son of the king of the gods, in fact, Zeus, uh, who, who uh, slept with his, uh, a human woman and gave birth to a demigod. And Perseus sort of followed in that legacy and you know, sought to become a hero. He slaughtered um, the, the monster Medusa and took her head, which could turn anybody to stone. And as part of his journey, he encountered a princess who had been chained to a rock and offered as a sacrifice to the Cetus, to the sea monster, in order to placate the gods. Because the gods were offended that her mother had said that her daughter was so beautiful she even eclipsed some of the, some of the gods themselves. And so the gods said, well, you cannot say that and not be punished, but we must punish you. And so you have to sacrifice your daughter. And the sea monster was coming to eat the princess, the princess Andromeda, when Perseus came and saved her life by slaying the sea monster. And it's interesting to me that as we're looking up into the stars, we're sort of getting to know what these stories are, why they were important to the ancients. It's interesting to me that we're finding these stories of gods and demigods slaying monsters. And it, it kind of seems so uh, primitive, perhaps, or parochial, or, or you know, it's, it doesn't really, really feel connected with our own conception of the gods. Because the God has to be something bigger and greater than that, right? So as we're looking into creation, we're thinking of God and the creation that, that, uh, that he or she would have been engaged in. Certainly the psalmist in Psalm 19 is thinking that, is looking at creation saying, this is evidence of God. But what God is the psalmist actually thinking of? Well, 
this God, Yahweh. Yahweh was the God of the ancient Hebrews. And the story is told in the Psalms, in Psalm 74, that Yahweh actually was involved in one of these sea monster battles. It's not often preached about in Sunday sermons, uh, but it's there. In Psalm 74, the psalmist says that Yahweh divided the sea with his might, the sea being the sea monster, broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters, crushed the heads of Leviathan, split open the springs and the brooks, and with that established the heavenly lights and the sun, fixing the boundaries of the earth, making summer and winter. So Yahweh is one of these gods, one of these primitive pagan gods who fights the sea monster, destroys it, and with it makes heaven and earth. And this is not just unique to Yahweh. Of course, this is just of a kind. We find in the Babylonian tradition, the story of Marduk and Tiamat in the Enuma Elish, where almost the exact same thing happens. Instead of Leviathan, the sea monster is called Tiamat. Instead of Yahweh, it's Marduk. But the exact same thing happens. The, the sea monster is threatening the order that the gods are trying to create. And so Marduk attacks it. Marduk, the thunder god, the storm god, who rides the winds just like Yahweh, attacks the monster. The monster opens up its mouth wide to swallow him, and he rushes in with all the winds at his command and bursts the, the monster apart from the inside out. And with that, cuts it in half like a fish, and one half of the monster becomes the heavens, the other half becomes the earth. So we find this, this primitive sort of fear of the other, fear of the chaos, fear of the dragon, fear of the monster at work in our earliest layers of religious thought. The gods that we wanted to have were the gods that would fight off the monsters on our behalf. And, and that itself was tied inexorably into the act of creation. Now, the authority and the order that these gods brought was also manifested in human society, right? So this is actually one of the Hammurabi steels that's found in the Louvre, actually. And some, of the, some of these uh, accounts of the, the Hammurabi code uh, associate Hammurabi with, um, with another god, but many of them uh, feature him with Marduk, received the law from Marduk, the king of the gods. And the, the code of Hammurabi is fairly simply described as an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. This is a law that makes sense coming from a God like that, coming from a God like Marduk, or coming from Yahweh. This eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Maybe it made sense at the infancy of our species, but we hear something like that, and there's something that, that in us that opposes that. There's something about that where we look at it and we say, that is... That's not just wrong, it's sort of childishly wrong. It's simplistically wrong. And I, I think about this, this Hammurabi code, and I'm reminded of a really interesting episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Are there any Trekkies here in the audience? Probably a couple. In the first season, uh, there's an episode called Justice, where the Enterprise encounters this planet that's full of these really, really happy, pleasant people, they're, they're all beautiful, the men and the women, they're all beautiful. They're all, you know, kissing each other and having fun. And, you know, it's like this pleasure paradise planet. And they think to themselves, wow, this is really amazing. These people are really great. And they come to find out that the way the society operates is by allowing this, some sort of a god, which is revealed to be some alien intelligence. They allow this god to establish this arbitrary set of rules on them that they have to follow. And it's, it's a very simple set of rules. It's very much like the Code of Hammurabi, and they do not question it. And just like the Code of Hammurabi, the penalty for breaking the rule is death. Well, they find this out, of course, after the young uh, Ensign Wesley, Crusher, has, of course, broken one of these rules, as a teenager is wont to do. And the inhabitants of this planet say, okay, well, time for you to die. And it's not anything personal. They're not angry at him, per se. They're just saying, well, look, this is what God says. God says we have to kill you now. So that's the way it works. 
And the crew of the Enterprise says, no, 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 no. That, maybe that works for you, but we've, we're, our society is, is beyond that now. We don't need these simple rules from some God telling us what is right and wrong. And there's a great scene where Picard, he's defending his crew against this very alien intelligence that has power over these people. And he says, to any creature who may be listening, there can be no justice so long as laws are absolute. Even life itself is an exercise, an exception. And then Riker, standing beside him, says, when has justice ever been as simple as a rule book? And at that point, the alien intelligence appears to agree, and they let them leave without suffering the penalty. When has justice ever been as simple as a rule book? There's another great part of the Star Trek universe. It's a kind of an underrated film. I kind of like it. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Of course, during the film, uh, the Enterprise is hijacked by Spock's half-brother, who is insistent that he can find God himself at the center of the universe, center of the galaxy. And of course, they, they do eventually find this mystical planet, and they find a creature who looks for all intents and purposes like God, appears to be God. McCoy is pretty darn convinced that it is God, in fact. But then this creature says, thanks for coming to me. Now bring your ship closer that I might use it. And that moment, Kirk says, wait a minute. I need to ask a question here. What does God need with a starship? Just that question. What does God need with a starship? And in that instant, we know that is not God. And we can put anything else in that fill in the blank. What does God need with anything? What does God need with us? What does God need with our worship? What does God need with anything? Right? Any God that has a need of something. We see through that instantly. That is an illusion broken. Any God like that, that makes demands, that needs sacrifices, is not a God worthy of worship. When we look up into the cosmos, what is it that we see? In the 5th century BC, the Greek thinker Protagoras said, about the gods, I have no means of knowing, either that they exist or that they do not exist, or what they are to look at. Many things prevent my knowing, among others, the fact that they are never seen. This is in the 5th century B.C. And that's precisely the, the, where we are right now. In the 21st century, we look up into the cosmos, we can see things that we've never seen before. We see things that the ancient Greeks could not even imagine. But what don't we see? We don't see God. And so that puts us in a quandary. Because everything about our being, everything about the story that we tell ourselves, is that we want there to be something. We want there to be some, some meaning and purpose out there in the cosmos. And so I say, okay. Let's let there be a God out there in the cosmos. But let's, let's not put our own ideas of what God should be out there. Let's let the cosmos speak to us. And what does the cosmos tell us very clearly? There is no God like Marduk. There is no God like Yahweh. There is no God like what the ancients believed in. There is a God who is not there. And that is as significant a departure from our assumptions about the way the world works as anything. I mean, it is a, it is a Copernican-type paradigm shift to think about the God who is not there. Now, as we're staring up into the abyss, wondering where God is, I'm, I'm reminded of Nietzsche who 
in Beyond Good and Evil, wrote this aphorism that's made a substantial impact. He said, he who fights with monsters should look to it that he himself does not become a monster. And if you gaze long into abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. And there's, I think, some truth to that, right? So the, uh, we ourselves, humans, who fight and engage with monsters, it's all too easy for us to become the very thing that we're fighting against. But if it's true of us, is it not true of the gods themselves? If we put into power gods who struggle with monsters, the gods whose very act of creation is that of fighting the monsters, what does that say of the gods? Do those gods not then become the very monsters that they have sought to kill? Right? You look at the codes that they've handed down. Look at the Hammurabi code. Look at the Old Testament code. Those are the codes of monsters. Those are codes based in fear. And the gods of fear may have been fine for our time, for the infancy of our species, but they are not worthy of worship. Not by us, not now, not that we know so much more about the cosmos. These are not the gods that we can look to to show us love. They are the gods of fear. So how then do we find love? Can we look to the cosmos to show us what that is? The Apostle Paul said in his first letter to the Corinthians, So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. I think even non-Christians agree with that. Why is love so powerful to us? Why is it such a great motivator? In the last line of his Paradise, Dante Alighieri said that it's love itself that moves the sun and the other stars. Love itself is the engine of the cosmos. I think he may have been right about that. When we look at the stars, when we look at the sun, what do we see? We see light, of course, but what's in the light? What is in that? There's a mystery there. And it was only discovered a couple hundred years ago by a fellow named Fraunhofer, who saw that when we look at the spectrum of light that comes from the stars, we find these little gaps, these little black lines. And what those are, are elements that are being absorbed by the gas in the stars, by the light itself. And that we can see how those elements in these stars match with the very same elements that are here on earth. The very same elements that make us up. The very same iron that flows through our blood is out in the cosmos, is coming from the cosmos. As Carl Sagan said, as Neil Tyson has said, we are not just in the cosmos. The cosmos is in us, and this is proof of that. We are connected inexorably, atomically, to the cosmos around us. So what the cosmos is teaching us is connection. We are not isolated. We are not adrift in a, a sea of chaos. There is not a dragon coming for us. We do not need a God to save us from that. We are of a part of the greater whole. When you take a breath, when you breathe in, you are doing something intensely spiritual. Right? All of us here in this room, we've been breathing together, not really thinking about it. But every breath that we take and every, everything we exhale, we are sharing the same molecules with each other. The, the more time we spend together, the more connected we are in a very physical, natural way. And that is, I think, what, what love is you know, at a foundational level. And everything that is layered on top of it is just connection after connection, right? So what happens when two people fall in love? They don't just share the, the same air. Of course, they do share a lot of that. They share that. They share the water, their food, their bodies, their space, their time, their experience. Everything about themselves is shared. Everything about themselves becomes a connection. That is love. And that is taught to us by the cosmos. 
Now, <clears throat> Carl Sagan, when he was working on Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, of course, I mentioned the, the golden phonograph. One of the things that was included in this phonograph was a digital recording of a young woman's brain waves. That woman was Anne Druyan. Now, she went and had her brain recorded, had her brain waves recorded on June 3rd, 1977. And this actually shows that recording. This is Anne Druyan's brain waves from June 3rd, 1977. On June 1st, 1977, she and Carl first proclaimed their love for each other. They had been working very closely together, and without even realizing it, they had fallen in love. So as her brain was being recorded, she was thinking intensely about love, about this man that she cared so much about. And that was recorded and placed on the golden phonograph and is now traveling outside of our solar system on Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Why is it that when we look up at the cosmos, we see ourselves reflected back at us? Right? The, the instinct for the ancients was to, to create these stories, to try to make sense of things, to try to bring order to the chaos. But now we're, we're, we're older than that. We're not infants anymore. We're adolescents. So we're ready to venture outside of our crib, the earth. And I think it's fascinating that the first thing that we send outside of our solar system is love. We've sent love out. And when we come to the end of our life, I think perhaps we find that the meaning and the purpose that we've been seeking all along was inside us. We've been looking for the cosmos. The cosmos is in us. The search for that meaning and purpose is the purpose itself. But it's the how, how we do that that makes a difference. How do we search? Do we search because we're afraid? Are we afraid of the chaos? Are we afraid of the monster? Do we want to fight the monster? Do we want someone to fight the monster for us? Or do we search because we want to love, because we want to learn, and we want to seek out what we do not know? In the end, I think there are only two things that we can know for certain. We are the cosmos, and we are love. Go now and love well. Thank you.